when you have um, two two Hindus who didn't you know didn't really believe anything, and um, you know one is just describing the 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 holy city of God like John did. And then he realizes he's up in this very high place and, and he's like, where am I? And he looks down to his left and he describes, he said, it was so scary. He said, it scares me to this day to think about it. That's what you have to realize is mm-hmm. what they experience is more real than this. The good mm-hmm. is more real. The bad is more real, which in, unless you read it, you don't, you don't comprehend what they're saying, but I tried to show you. But- it's it's truly this world is a compressed experience of life. The life to come is much better, but it's also much worse. And I believe that's why God has us here in a time of choosing. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. Pastors, I know how hard it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, and especially you're preaching week after week. So maybe you hit a writer's block or it's Friday and you haven't really finished things up. I wanna help. So I've got a 10 step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I simplified the whole prep process into a series of steps and reminders that can help you ensure your sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description and you'll get a copy sent to you for free today. This episode is also presented by 10 by 10. Did you know that approximately 1 million young people in America drift from their faith every year? And this means that by 2034, 10 million young people will walk away from their faith and miss out on experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. Well, imagine if we could do something to reverse this. That's why 10 by 10 was born, a national initiative created to help make faith matter more to 10 million young people over the next 10 years. Together, we can turn the tide of young people walking away from their faith. So the question is, will you answer the call to help 10 by 10 advocate for the faith of the next generation? You can go to 1010 Dot org to learn more. That's 1010.org to learn more. And now to today's episode. John, good to have you back. Hey, Carrie. Great to be back. Appreciate so, it. So you recently stepped down from Gateway, a church that you absolutely poured your heart into for how many years? Did you lead it? 25. 25. Planted, my wife and I planted Gateway 25 years ago. So you're this the founder. Weekend. This weekend. And wow. So, (laughs) okay, go ahead. It's our, yeah, it's our 25th anniversary this weekend. Does it feel weird that you're not the lead pastor at the 25th? Yeah, a little. (laughs) Um, uh, Because I I literally, this week, I had no idea what was happening. So that was different, you know? Uh There are adjustments, but mostly I'm pretty giddy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I mean, for me, it was 2015. I had led for 20 years, the same people for 20 years. And I was still working full time. I was still teaching at the church at that time. And then that wound down in 2020 on a regular basis. Anyway, I'm doing a series next month, but it's very occasional now. We still go and everything, but I felt like I was on vacation, even though I had a 50 hour week ahead of me. It was the weirdest thing. Like, You've had that kind well, of giddiness? I don't think, yeah, I don't think people realize the, the constant stresses and challenges and, and many different hats you've got to switch in one week um, to, to lead, you know, to lead a church and mm-hmm. also be a teacher and also be a decision maker and a problem solver. And there is, there's just a constant high level, you know, stress that, I always took a great solace in Paul's words, you know, where he talks about being shipwrecked and spent a night in the deep and bitten by snakes and twice he was killed. And he said, and above all that, I had the worries of all the churches. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So so this is a question I don't think I've asked. We talked about succession. It's coming up a, a lot on the podcast, which is great. I think it's a, an 
a, a crisis that's only going to get worse, right? As fewer people go into ministry, more and more people hit their 60s and 70s. It's like, yeah, I think I need, I think I'm finished at this point. It's going to get to be a bigger crisis. It sounds to me, so let's let's unpack it in a couple of phases. Um, when you stepped away, right now you're still feeling giddy a little bit. We're, how tired were you? When you when you tapped out in May of 2023, uh, was there like this post adrenaline crash? Uh, what were you going through in the first couple of months after stepping back? No, I think um, you know. I mean, d- to be fair, COVID shifted everything. Fair, um, yeah. And so I don't know that my I don't know that my transition, I I was thinking about this, you know, because our congregation, Mm. you know, transition means change. People don't like change. They resist change, but they hadn't had a choice. Mm. And, um, and so for me as well, you know, I had been, I had been working on this for quite a while Yeah, and I had been giving over more and more and more to test the new leadership and to test how the congregation responded. And so, no, I think, I think everybody was kind of like, okay, this is good. It's time. Um, what, I, what I've heard over and over again is uh, we've never seen a transition go this smoothly. And I've never mm. been through one, so I have no mm. idea. I've never been in a church that's been through one. Um, right. But apparently they don't go well usually. Uh, that is true. <laughs> that's what, that is true. That's what word on the street keeps telling me is like, you know, there's some train wrecks along the way. But how are you feeling? In those months after? I think, you know, I mean, to be honest, I think you feel kind of like um, probably a mother who has watched her, her children for 25 years or, you know, 20, 20 years, and then you send them off to college and it's the right thing. You want them grown up and able to keep going without you, but you're also going to miss them. There's a, there's a little, mm. there's a little grief. And then all this freedom. So there's, there's both. <laughs> and that's, you know, and, and I think, you know, I think I've, that's, I've been through that. Although, um, you know, I think a very important part of it is also knowing what God's calling you to, not just what he's asking you to walk from. And I'm not leaving Gateway. I'm, I'm shifting titles to founding pastor but I'm not, Carlos Ortiz is the new uh, senior pastor, and I'm there to support him and support hmm. the leadership. How did that journey untangle for you? Like, how were you able to say, okay, there was a phase of my life, I'm called to this new thing, the season is right for me to hand things over to Carlos and to trust the next generation of leadership. How, how did you wrestle, like, what happened to your identity in the middle of that shift? Well, I, I, I mean, let me say this. It wasn't like uh, these, these 12 people in one week said this, and the next week I went to the elders and said, hey, here's what's up. No, it was a trickle, and I was struggling. So I was like, Lord, what do you, I mean, why does this keep happening? This is kind of blowing me away, and is this really, am I getting this right? Because I mean, this is bizarre, and I wasn't thinking that way. I thought I was just going to pastor this for a long, long time, and so I'm wrestling, and and I had to go back to, okay, well, how did I get here? And I literally did. There's a there's a mountain in Santa Barbara. I used to live in Santa Barbara that I go up to. I've made every big decision of faith up there because I'm, I'm a visionary. And so I, I realized after years of doing this that the Lord is, was giving me a physical picture of my spiritual reality. I had to get way up high where I could look all around and look out. And I did that again. And I just went back through every time my wife and I stepped out in faith and trusted the Lord. Um, you know, I went from engineering to being a college pastor, to being a missionary overseas, to be an executive pastor, and then we planted Gateway. And every time, um, just seeing how faithful he was Mm -hmm. and through the valleys, you know, trusting him through the valleys and how faithful he was. And basically getting to a point of like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. Everything Mm -hmm. could fall apart. 
you know, because you, you run all those scenarios. You're like, well, what if this? And what if that? And what if that? And you have to come back in the end to who, who do I really trust? Do I trust in horses and chariots or is it going to be in the Lord? And if he's, if he's leading you, then ultimately you got to take a step and follow. So after I came back from that, you know, my mountaintop Santa Barbara vacation, uh, I went to the overseers and I, our, our spiritual elders, and I told them, hey, here's what's going on. I need you to pray with me. Now, that was 18 months into the first time the Lord kind of knocked me around with this. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a short decision. No, that's that's very honest. You know, with with um, taking the leap, because I think you've identified a couple of issues. One of them, obviously, is financial, that a lot of pastors are like, I kind of need the job. I don't know what else I'm going to do. And the other, though, is the whole question of identity, right? Like, oh, this is who I am, I thought. And I always thought, it, you know, and I'm, I'm asking this as a question. It's going to sound like a statement, John, but... You know, I had this podcast. It wasn't what it was. I was speaking. I was starting to write books. But, I mean, it wasn't, you know, put your feet up and coast for the rest of your life kind of money or success. But it was something to step into. And you have a number one New York Times bestseller, you know, on your hands. Do you think that makes it easier? Or do you have any other reflections on like people, listeners who are struggling with their identity right now? Because yeah, you know, I can see someone saying, if I had a number one New York Times bestseller in my back pocket, I could step into that too. Or Carrie, yeah, if I was on my way to 30 million downloads, yeah, I would probably find that easy too. Now, I maybe had 500,000 downloads when I stepped out of the pastor, maybe less than that. I don't know. Can't remember. Mm -hmm. This podcast was barely a year old when I when I stepped down. So maybe it was a couple hundred thousand. I don't know. Still a lot, but like not enough to, you know, totally say, ah, the future's made. It involved faith for both of us. But what about for the person who says there's no obvious place for me? Any thoughts or advice? Well, I think I would I would spend a lot of time praying and being quiet before the Lord and see, here's the thing I know for sure. Um, as long as we're on this earth, we still have purpose. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the things, as you know, I write about is that sometimes we think that purpose is some grandiose thing. The purpose may be as simple as a few people um, and how, how we build into them or treat them or care for them. And the Lord's economy just doesn't go like our economy. And, and I'm talking about pastoral economy too, mm -hmm, butts mm -hmm. and seats, numbers, bigness, you know, I mean, we, we fall prey to the same thing the world does, right? And, and sometimes the Lord's way is, is a way of obscurity. I mean, look at Moses, 40 mm -hmm. years in the desert. Look at Abraham after the promise, you know, I mean, it's like, he's got a history of this thing. And, um, and so I, I think don't get caught up thinking it's got to be some huge, big, grandiose thing. Search your heart and ask the Lord, what, you know, why do you still have me here? What am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed this, to be? I've been in this new phase a lot longer than you, eight years now. But, and I've, so I've had eight years to think about it, <laughs> you know, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Probably the phrase I'm coming back to increasingly, especially over the last couple of years, because I know at some point all this is going to go away, right? It always does. There'll be a day where you don't write books. There'll be a day where maybe you write books and they don't sell, or days where you podcast and nobody listens. So, you know, those days aren't here yet, but they could come. I get it. I think for me, the metaphor is contributor. And if you look at the vision of retirement that our culture paints, it's you're a consumer, you know? All you can golf, all you can eat, all you can drink, all you can lie at the beach, all you can fill in the blank, right? All you can hike, all you can kayak, whatever you want, all you can travel. And that's a consumer mentality. And I think a lot of people who listen to the show would find that very disappointing. Hey, it's fun for two weeks. Go enjoy, have some fun, take a break, take a sabbatical. But I think we're designed, God designed us to contribute. And so I think for me, and my wife and I talk about this a lot, at 80, I want to be contributing still. And I wonder if that's sure. sort of the principle underneath that question. I think yeah. so. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I, um, two things. One, um, a lot of pastors, and I did too, would say, hey, there is no retirement. 
There's not yeah. retirement in the Bible. You don't retire from the Great Commission. You don't retire from mm-hmm. ministry. And that was kind of my perspective. And then my very good friend, Ken Cockrum, who was the head, he was, you know, been the head of huge missions organization. He, he kind of called me on that. And he mm-hmm. showed me Numbers chapter eight, last couple verses. And it says, Moses, uh, God, the Lord said to Moses, um, the Levites, the priests, oh, right? Yeah. They are to work in the temple service from age 25 to 50. And then they must retire from the work. They can help, but they are to let the younger generation carry the load of the work. And I think there's something, one, merciful in that. God God knows our humanity. He knows that, you know, Entropy is real in a sinful world. You know, everything's breaking down and shutting down. And it's it's our big aha warning that, hey, this life is not it. We all know that. But sometimes we don't honor it. And, and so I think there is an honoring of the seasons of life. And this is a moving into a season of wisdom, not grinding it out, doing it more, 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 you know, mm-hmm. and, and of raising up a new generation and supporting and supporting them. And so, um, you know, that doesn't say you have to retire at 50. That Mm -hmm. says that the Lord wants you to empower others and a new generation, raise up a new generation and not just, you know, uh, press forward in your own charisma and effort until you die and everybody dies with you. That's, Mm -hmm. That's not really his way. I'm glad you reminded us of that. You know, I was having dinner with Mark Batterson probably a month after I, maybe the week I stepped out of the lead pastor role. I was in DC and we went out for dinner, his wife, my wife. And he reminded me of that passage. And I'm like, well, I was 50 then. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's good. There is biblical precedent. Okay. Last question before we switch to your new project, which I am fascinated by, which is biggest surprise since you stepped out of the lead pastor role. Um, biggest surprise. I, you know, lately <laughs> I've just had, I've just had, uh, I've just been worshiping the Lord every morning, all day. Um, and I just have so much joy. I'm, I'm just kind of giddy. And so I didn't think I was going to be able to go to church every Sunday and look forward to it this soon. Hmm. That's I really a great didn't. story. And you're going to Gateway, watching someone Gateway. else lead it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Watching them do, do things I wouldn't do and watching things fall apart in front of me. And, and <laughs> well, you know, it, that always happens. I know happens. what you mean. It's it, not it, it's falling not, apart. It, it but... happened under my watch all the time. It's just <laughs> yes. I always felt the weight of it. Like, oh, uh-huh. crud, okay. I got to make sure someone's doing something about that. And now I just say, hmm, not my problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I pray and, and, and I've been able to really just like worship the Lord and love on people. I stand out and greet. And so I see hmm. people. It's awesome as well, though it's a, little, it's a little humbling. It's like I turned to my wife the other day, we were greeting and I go, you do realize that half these people don't have a clue who we are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's good because it's growing. It's growing and it's growing in a new way, even in six months. I met a bunch of new staff. I was at Connexus today because I'm teaching uh, next month. And uh, I met a bunch of new staff, some interns. And now I'm down to, yeah, I used to work here back in the day. Nice to meet you. You know, that's the, yeah. they don't know what a founding pastor is. They don't care. It's no. ancient history. It's just like, yeah, I used to work here once. Anyway, yeah, what's your name? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. So I love, I love your new book. So you wrote Imagine Heaven and then your new one, which I had the privilege of reading a few months ago and had the privilege of endorsing and did so very happily and heartily, is called Imagine the God of Heaven. Made me cry in parts. Um, John, your books, your last two, Restore My Faith. Like, I feel like, oh, everything I built my whole life on is true. Like, this is good. This is good. Mm. This is good. But I want to start from the skeptic's perspective. And you engaged that. You were a skeptic at one point in your life. Oh, yeah. Uh, We covered that in another episode. But 
Skeptics have a field date with this stuff, near-death experiences. So let's start there. Uh, some critics would argue that NDEs or near-death experiences are just the brain's way of coping. So basically, let me give the overview. Imagine Heaven, which hit number one for many, many weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list, and then this new book are all your take on, I guess at this point, thousands of near-death experiences, mm -hmm. compiled stories, snippets from people's experiences, and then trying to trace out how it reconciles with scripture, where it might differ, et cetera, et cetera. Just fascinating reads. So a lot of people would say, well, near-death experiences, yeah, people's brain stem isn't entirely dead. This is just you know, I'm not a scientist, but brain cells like pumping out images that they report back as a near-death experience. Yes, what do you say to those skeptics? Well, and as you know, I mean, I wrote the second chapter really pointing out that there have been about 30 alternative explanations. Mm -hmm. And as as my friend, Dr. Jeff Long, who, who has studied thousands of these as well, likes to say is, why do you need 30 if there's one good one? <laughs> but there's not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. what you find is people throwing spaghetti at the wall, hoping something will stick mm -hmm. because this points to the God of the Bible and the heaven and the hell of the Bible. And that's what I'm trying to show. I, I, I really believe this is God's apologetic, God's new apologetic for a, global, a globally connected world. But what I would say and what I, you know, I go through in chapter two, I go through 10 points of evidence that convinced me and, and many skeptical doctors as well who have studied this, that this stuff is real. Um, and I'm not going to go can through Can you all, share a few? Just share yeah, one I'm not going to go through all 10. I'll, I'll quickly yeah. go through four. So one, you know, a common scientific principle is what is commonly observed is real. Uh, that's the most fundamental. You, you make observations. If it's consistent, then it's, that's real. And so here, what we have, people don't realize this, but millions of people around the globe have had these experiences where they clinically die, their heart stops beating, there are no brain waves, they should not be able to perceive anything or remember anything, and yet they come back, and again, millions of people all over the globe say the same things. So in both Imagine Heaven and Imagine the God of Heaven, I show, you know, they're like, I trace probably about 40 commonalities of things they say Mm -hmm. about what they experience in the life to come. Now, they don't all experience all 40. Some experience two, some experience 10, 20, you know, some 30. But they overlap. Now, think about that. I mean, you're a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and you're an engineer, right? So yeah. you come at it with an analytical mind. I do. I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. And, and, yeah. and that's why I'm so excited about this, because it's so convincing and compelling to me. So in a, in a court of law, if you have 10 um, witnesses come in and they all say exactly the same thing, that's collusion. Mm -hmm. They talked, right? That's bad testimony. But if you have 10 eyewitnesses come in and they all say slightly different things that overlap, but from unique perspectives, well, that's incredibly strong testimony. So that's what you have with millions of people around the globe. Well, that's one. Two, um, when people have clinically die and they have a near-death experience, they talk about leaving their body, um, but they have a spiritual body, just like Paul talked about. Mm. And we talked about it, I think, in the last podcast. You know, I really, I, I believe Paul might have had a near-death experience. Yeah. Uh, in Acts 14, when he was stoned to death in Lystra, and then he gets mm. back up. And, and then in 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about when, you know, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I was taken up to the third heaven. And then he talks in 1 Corinthians 15 all about the body, the spiritual body that's buried in weakness and raised in power and, you know, buried, buried a natural body, but raised a spiritual body. Hmm. Well, these people confirm that. And initially they leave their body, but they're up above watching their resuscitation. So here's a the key. They make veretical observations. In other words, they make mm -hmm. verifiable observations. And, and there have been studies done of uh, you know, people who have had these and the things they claim to observe while they had no brain waves 
and no heartbeat and should not have been able to see or hear from any perspective. And yet what, what this study found is 92% of their observations, each, each one may make multiple observations, right? What's going on in the room. 92% were totally correct. 6% were mostly correct. Only 2% uh, were, were false. And it was actually mm. one person. <laughs> wow. And then yeah, that, but that, stuff like, hey, there was a shoe on the roof of the hospital that day on the upper floor, which you would have no way of looking at. And then they discovered that there was a shoe. Or well, something. and that's, I mean, that's a whole other point of evidence besides ah. just observing the room is traveling and seeing things you shouldn't have seen. Um, but, but even a more, uh, two more uh, powerful ones are, you know, so, so how do you, if it's just a brain-based thing, or let's say, you know, people say, well, it's, it's hallucination from drugs or things like that. But, uh, you know, I talk about how, no, there are studies that have done that show the same NDE observations on, on you know, like um, um, hospital drugs or not. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't, that doesn't account for it. Um, but the other thing is that blind people, when they have a near-death experience, can see. And I report, I report several in Imagine the God of Heaven um, who not only see, but they describe things that they, they couldn't have seen otherwise. And, and they describe things that check out. And another thing that's just fascinating to me is that the blind, if they do have a full-blown experience and they're in this heavenly realm, so there's one guy, Brad Burroughs, that... Um, He's a beautiful, he, he just loves Jesus now. He's a worship leader now. Um, but when he was eight, he had this experience. And he talks about how the light of heaven comes out of everything and how fascinating it was and how he could never have imagined what light was like. Vicky, another blind person. Debbie, another blind. They say the same thing, that the light comes out of everything. Mm. Now, think about this, because most Christians don't know this. I find that Isaiah 60 and Revelation 21 says the same thing. There is no sun or moon in heaven. The glory of God is its light. And John says, and the nations will walk in that light. Mm -hmm. So, and the light is not light like our light. And they talk about this. It's life and it's love and light altogether. It's his glory. And it's giving life to everything. And so when you... When you think about that, though, evidentially, why in the world would blind people ever say that light in heaven comes out of things? They would have never heard that light works that way on earth. They would have heard light shines on things. Hmm. The last, the, the fourth out of the 10 I'll, I'll mention is God. So what I'm showing in Imagine the God of Heaven are people from every continent, every cultural and even religious background, but they are experiencing the, the presence of the same God of light and love all over the world. And that's not who they expected necessarily. Hmm. And that to me is like, figure that out. That doesn't make any sense at all. And yet that's what they're commonly reporting. And in Imagine the God of Heaven, that's what I'm trying to show, Carrie, is I'm trying to show that this God of light and love is, he didn't just show up on the scene. Hmm. He's been revealing himself since the burning bush that wouldn't burn up and this glorious light that led Israel. And he's been doing something for the sake of all nations since Genesis 12, when he created a nation, the Jewish nation, to bless all nations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, so what I'm trying to show is how it, it all ties together, but also to help people see what this God is actually like. And, and for Christians as well, because I think without meaning to, and I, I'm put myself in this category, we put God in a box. Mm -hmm. God is far more glorious and powerful and sovereignly in control than you've ever imagined. But God is also far more involved with you and relatable and personable, humorous and even fun 
than you've ever imagined. And I think we've got to stretch our categories as Christians. I think, hmm. I think that's an important thing. And when you see what God has revealed in Scripture, but what I'm also doing is I'm, I'm taking 70 of these people's stories of being in his presence and what they're describing, and you see not only how they overlap, but how they illustrate what the Bible's told us all along. But in a way, hopefully, and I mean, you can, you can say more, but in a way that causes you to fall more in love with God and realize, oh my gosh, he is what I've always wanted. He's the love I've always wanted. Yeah, it's very emotional in the most positive way. And that's why when you sent me the manuscript and I read it, I mean, my wife picked it up as soon as I was done. Are you finished with that? Are you finished with that? And she had the same experience I did. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited for this to get out there, but I want to hang with the skeptics a bit more sure. because the one thing you say, God of light and love, like, how is this not just universalism? Is it that, you know, people of the Baha'i faith see their God, Buddhists see their, well, Buddhists are technically not atheistic religion, uh, but, you know, uh, Muslims yeah. see Allah, Christians see Jesus, Jews see a different God, you know, maybe right. Jehovah or Yahweh. Like, is it, or is it that we just see this universal new age portrait of a God of light and goodness and good vibes and karma? Or like, like you know, how do, how do you get to Jesus through this? Yeah, and I mean, that's one of the things that's just been, so amazing, Carrie, is how the Lord brought me stories from all over the world. Yeah. Um, when, he, when he told me, you know, write again, I was like, okay, well, I researched this for 35 years before I wrote Imagine yeah. Heaven. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when, you when you're 100, you're writing another one. Bit, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. And he did. It's just so amazing. So as you know, you know, I, I, I tell the story of Santosh, mm -hmm. this manufacturing engineer who grew up in India Dad was a Sanskrit scholar. The Hindu scriptures and the Hindu gods is all he ever knew. And yet this God of light and love that he falls in love with takes him to this place and he describes the new Jerusalem like John describes it in, in Revelation 21. Now, he didn't even know what he's describing. He calls this a giant compound, right? With 12 gates and angels outside. And I knew it was the kingdom of heaven. I wanted to go in. He also gets a, an experience of hell, a hellish reality. And then he sees who he now realizes was Jesus on his throne and a very narrow gate that was open to him. And, and the Lord is, is he, he sees all of his sins, a life review. He sees all of his sins. He falls to his knees and says, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. Cause he knows this is what I deserve. You know, this, this thing I've seen. And and the Lord's compassionate and merciful, long story short, sends him back. And two years later, his daughter, he's praying. He's back and he's like, this was not the God I expected. Hmm. And why was he so merciful and compassionate? Because I knew I deserved that. And it was very confusing to him. And he kept seeking, seeking. Of course, the Lord said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me, right? And his daughter gets invited to sing in a choir on Easter Sunday with a friend, Santosh and his wife go, he walks in and he feels the love that he felt in the presence of the same God of light. And the message is on the narrow gate and how Jesus is the gate through which the sheep can come and go and enter the kingdom of heaven. And he starts reading the Bible and he comes to faith in Jesus. So he had I have another didn't have words to describe who he met. And as he searches the scripture, it's like, oh, it's this guy. Yeah. Or like Bibi in Tehran, um, related to the prophet Muhammad. Uh, one, of her, one of her sons comes to faith in, in Jesus and, she, and starts leading others to Jesus. He, he actually led in the house church movement, um, underground house church movement. And she's just distraught because then her, her daughter comes to faith. She's failed as a, as a Muslim. And she one night is so, she's been so stressed out and distraught, she has a heart attack. And she has one of these experiences, but who comes to her was not the prophet Ali, which she was expecting to be judged because she had failed, um, failed, um, you know, failed in Islam. And instead she sees, the, describes almost the same 
figure that Santosh did, uh, this man in a robe and a beard and face like, like lightning, like the sun, and he says, I am he who is. Hmm. Hmm. I am he who is. Now, who's that remind you of? <laughs> and she comes back and same thing, starts seeking and she comes, she realizes, okay, this is the God of the Bible who revealed himself to Moses. And Jesus said, I am, you know, before Abraham was born, I am, you know, it's like, and again and again and again, I've got in the book, a, a, a Rwandan a Muslim imam from Rwanda who died of blood cancer and Jesus rescues him from a hellish experience. And he comes in and he looks like Jesus would look, except they, they describe him as brighter than the sun, but easy to look at, which mm. they, they often wrestle with words of how to explain that. And he holds out his hands and he sees nail holes in the hands and he had seen the passion of the Christ accidentally. And so he knew who this was. And then Jesus says, I died for mankind. You're one of the ones I died for. Do not deny it any longer and tell everyone. Hmm. And today he's a, he's a priest. He's an Anglican priest. And he's had six threats on attempts on his life. Because he's still, you know, in Rwanda <laughs> proclaiming Jesus. And on and on. I mean, we've... I've got many of those throughout the book, uh, Karina from Columbia. But let me say this. It's important to understand about these that they are testimonies, and you, and you can't take them for anything more. So think about it like this. Um, every testimony is an interpretation of something that happened, right? Right? And let's say, let's say in Jesus' day, we, we had gone around with a microphone and interviewed people who had seen Jesus' miracles, right? Well, some are going to say, he's of God. He must be the Messiah. How could mm -hmm. he do things like this otherwise? And others saw the same thing and re would report the same thing, but interpret it as, well, he's obviously a demonic sorcerer, just like our religious leaders have said. Mm -hmm. So you've got the same event being testified to, but you have different interpretations. That's what you have with NDEs. So you have- It's very important to understand. That is really important to understand. So you have thousands of stories, but when you look at the, uh, the overall literature on NDEs, is there globally, like people who have experiences of Allah, people who have experiences of maybe they meet the prophet Muhammad, maybe, uh, you know, in Hinduism, there are hundreds of thousands of gods. Maybe they meet someone else. Like, are you seeing different manifestations or overwhelmingly does the evidence point in the direction of the God of the Bible, Jesus? Well, overwhelmingly, the evidence points to this God of light and love who is not an impersonal force, he's personal. Like in his presence, they feel a love that's beyond anything we ever called love. And they're known like they've never been known before. And he's, he's personal. Now, there are interpretations though that vary. So for instance, I, in the book, I talk about um, Nia, who's a young, uh, young girl who actually... Um, got in Africa, uh, who a lioness bit her head and, um, and, and she clinically died. And she talks about how she went to this glorious place and it was like, and she described it as there was, there was this fire, this light, this glow. And then she said, God is definitely real. And, and then she said, um, when she came back, though, so she came back and, and she said, I, she described that God of light and fire and glow as, um, as the goddess Durga. Mm. Now, she had, she, her family had worshipped Durga. But here's the thing. Durga is always described as a beautiful woman riding a lion with eight to ten arms with weapons in her arms. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was nothing like that. But what she described was this god of light 
and love who's personal. Mm-hmm. Same, same thing, another guy I talk about. Oh, but, but Nia also came back, interestingly saying, she also came back with a knowledge of Jesus Christ and of Christianity that she previously had not had. Wow. Now, why is that? Huh. Um, you also have, uh, you know, a, a, another person I have in the book um, who, who was a um, chief anesthesiologist, uh, Hindu uh, background, although probably just agnostic at that point. And he also starts in a hellish experience, cries out to God for repentance. He said he was repenting. And he is rescued and taken by two Christian angels into the presence in this beautiful place in the presence of this God of light and love who gives him a life review. He sees all the ways he needs to change and he comes back. And then he has another experience of this God of light. And he says, who are you, Lord? Mm. And he says, out of the light steps a bearded man in a white robe, uh, who says to him, I am Jesus, your savior. Wow. So you've got, I mean, yeah, there are people who will say, I saw my my own God. Mm -hmm. But what they're actually describing, that's an interpretation. What they're actually describing in in 99.5% of the cases I've studied is the same God of light and love. And what I'm trying to show and imagine the God of heaven, as you know, I kind of get into my geeky (laughs) engineering, showing what convinced me separate from these NDEs that God is real because he told us how we could know he's real and he put markers throughout history and anybody can check them out. And it shows that what he's been doing for all the nations and what these people of all the nations are saying, it all aligns. Yeah. No, they're fascinating reads. And I just, I wanted to play into that because, I mean, you even have tremendous skeptics within Christianity as well. Um, You have quite a few doctors in both books and in your research. Um, Is there anything in particular that happens when a trained physician, surgeon, nurse, or other medical professional who kind of understands the science of dying and all that stuff. When they have a near-death experience, what, what are you seeing in, in that clinical field? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's the same. Like who I was just <laughs> talking about was Dr. Rajiv Parti, who's an anesthesiologist. Yeah. And he yeah. had been in the room when people came back as an anesthesiologist, came back from surgery where they clinically died and they reported all the same things. And he would always give them a, a shot of antipsychotic drug because it's like... <laughs> That's crazy. You're crazy. Yeah. Just crazy. So he didn't believe it at all. And then it happened to him. And he's the one that I told you about, um, you know, who, who, when he came back, he was very confused. And he said to his, you know, told his wife what had happened. And she was like, well, where were, where were our gods? And why didn't you see the Hindu gods? He said, I don't know. And he, he actually um, got baptized uh, for faith in Jesus um, I've, I've, I've talked to him. I don't know. I, I don't know where he, well, I do know. Cause I asked him, I said, do you consider yourself a follower of Jesus? And he said, mm-hmm. Oh, I love Jesus. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But some other things, I mean, you know, probably a lot of, uh, you know, more mainstream evangelical Christians would kind of like, I don't know about that, you know? <laughs> and so, but this is very, very important to, to, to remember that just because these people are experiencing this this same God doesn't mean they believe in him or are right with him. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important to understand. You know, the same God of brilliant light appeared to a guy named Saul in Acts chapter 10, right? And he, when he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Mm -hmm. But notice something. Jesus does not tell him the gospel. Jesus does not tell him what he should believe or what he must do. 
And it was very helpful. The, you know, the reason it took me 35 years to write on this is I had the same questions. Like, well, why didn't he just tell them? Why, why, hey, why does God do things the way he does? I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's, he's a God. terrible telling yeah. God, right? Yeah. yeah. And But here's one thing that is absolutely true in scripture is he says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And he gives us a free will to seek him in order that we learn to love him freely. He doesn't force our hand. Mm-hmm. He guides us, his spirit prompts us and, and, and coaxes us toward him. But there's that, there's that interplay of, of God's doing the work in us, but he also has given us truly a free will to choose. Yeah. And we truly can choose to reject him. Well, on that note, that's a beautiful segue into the negative near-death experiences. You know, there's a lot of people who would call themselves Christians who, partly because of the culture and the way we've sort of moved philosophically, hell is a very distasteful idea. And if you're going to be a spiritual person, it's like, yeah, I believe in a God of light and love, and we all get there. It doesn't matter what you did. And, you know, then you get into, well, what about, and what about, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, where's the line? And it all kind of dissolves. But there's a lot of Christians who would say, yeah, hell, I'm not convinced. But you, like, what are NDEs teaching you about the shadow side of eternity? I know, you know, Carrie, I was actually like, man, Lord, like, all these ones you're sending me, they're great, but they're also, they've got this hellish part too. And like, how do I, I don't want to write about hell in every chapter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So are I most mean, dual, you are know, most dual well, or, or? So here's the interesting thing. Yeah. Is I find that people who don't, who don't know who this God is, but they do cry out sincerely from their heart at the last moment. I think it's like Joel too. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Um, well, and then we say, well, then they have to call on the name of Jesus. Well, Joel didn't know the name of Jesus. So obviously that's not completely accurate, <laughs> right? And we, I don't know if we want to get into all that. But the thing I think we, we fail to realize is the, the magnitude of what Jesus accomplished, for the sake of all nations. That's what he's always been doing. He created Abraham and Sarah to form a nation that he would bless to be a blessing, to bless all nations. And we know he blessed all nations through the preserving of his word, through the scriptures, and through the coming of the Messiah and the prophetic foretelling of that so we could know, you know, signposts in history. And I and I go into all that throughout the book as well. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm 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 derailing. Get me That's back okay. on. That's okay. I, I want saying? the scoop oh, hell. on hell. Hell. I want hell. the scoop on hell. Because you well, wrote about so, it in the so first in book. Imagine in heaven. Second. In yeah. Imagine Heaven, I devoted an entire chapter to hellish experiences. Um, but in this book, the Lord didn't let me not talk about it. It's it's sprinkled throughout in a weird. It's it's weird, but I kind of feel like He wants people to know. So Santosh, I was telling you about his story, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of these people, Rajiv, Santosh, Swedik, Karina, I mean, um, a guy named Jim Woodford, who is a, a Canadian commercial airline pilot who had never prayed a prayer in his life, but his, his wife was a believer and was praying for him to come to faith in Jesus. And, and literally, as he is dying of an, of an opioid overdose, because he had Guillain-Barre, but he got hooked, and his head is literally about to hit the steering wheel, and he cries out, God, forgive me, because he just realized he was dying, and he realized, I've never thanked God for all these things I thought were my doing, and he cries out, but all these people, I find, get first a glimpse of hell. It's a glimpse, Mm -hmm. but it's worse than you thought. Yeah, what do they see? Well... I mean, I I think the Lord wants me to write on this. I don't really want to write on it, mm-hmm. <laughs> like a whole book. We'll go there. But I think, you know, I think I think I'm supposed to eventually on, mm-hmm. you know, angels and demons and the whole the whole spiritual realm of what's going on and the and the reality. So 
hell is vast, but it's but it's also diverse. Um, and I don't know that I want to go farther into that right now because I don't have it all worked out. Yeah. Well, can you? So I mean, some of the stories. People, I mean, that uh, this was. But well, okay. Six when, seven when years. When you yeah. have, when you have um, two two Hindus who didn't, you know, didn't really believe anything. And, um, you know, one is just describing the, the, the holy city of God, like John did. And then he realizes he's up in this very high place and, and he's like, where am I? And he looks down to his left and he describes, he said, it was so scary. He said, it scares me to this day to think about it. That's what you have to realize is, mm -hmm. What they experience is more real than this. The good is more real. The bad is more real, which in, unless you read it, you don't, you don't comprehend what they're saying, but I tried to show you. But it's, it's truly this world is a compressed experience of life. The life to come is much better, but it's also much worse. And I believe that's why God has us here in a time of choosing. And why he's done everything he can to rescue us. And all, it's, all it takes is a, a humble heart saying, Lord, forgive me. I want what Jesus did to count for me. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Santosh sees this, what he calls an, a, an outer abyss of darkness. And at the bottom, a lake of fire. Why would, he, why would a Hindu describe it that way? Right? I mean... Mm -hmm. And, and then you've got uh, a, another who, um, who is describing like this horrible place of, and again, darkness, but also fire, which I used to actually kind of preach against that. I was like, well, obviously this is metaphorical. Metaphorical. You can have fire yeah. and darkness. But on the other side, you can have both. <laughs> An outer darkness they describe as if you buried yourself in the ground, it's darker than that, which that doesn't make sense to me either. And describing the same thing and then being a, a, attacked by demonic creatures. And then you have this Canadian pilot who, you know, I, I joke with him that, you know, Jim, you beat the thief on the cross for last minute crying out to God. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. But he also sees this like, like this, this abyss of, of darkness with what he described as like a, almost like a campfire just so far away. And yet then he describes this hideous creature that calls him by name and says, it's come with us. It's your time. And he's just freaked out that he knows my name. Like what? And, and again, he says, God help me. And he does, he rescues him. And I have more than I care to share of stories like that where people last minute. So what I find is, again, what people are experiencing is not necessarily, in fact, it's not eternity. I think that's another very right. important interpretive they key. They didn't I go found. to heaven and hell. So, they got a preview. No. And this in was fact, the trailer. In, in, in many cases, I think I write about this in the in the book. I, I can't remember, but in 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 some cases, Jesus tells them, you haven't died yet. You have to go back. Mm. Well, they clearly had died. They had no brain waves. So clinically, by our definition. Now, uh, another thing is they realize there's a border or a boundary in this experience that if they cross, they intuitively know they can't go back. Mm. And in some cases, the Lord will tell them, do you, want to, do you want to cross over? Do you want to come on with us or do you want to go back? In other cases, he says, you have to go back. You know, you haven't finished your, your purpose yet. You have to go back. And so what I find is, think about it like this. I could be invited to visit Buckingham Palace, right? And all the grounds. But that doesn't mean that I've now been adopted into royalty to live in, in the house with the family forever. And these near-death experiences are just visits. They're not, mm. they're not permanent moving in. So this, this is not indicative of someone's eternal destiny. Yeah. It's just showing the reality that there is an eternal destiny, just like the scriptures describe. There's a real heaven, and it's more glorious than we can ever imagine. There's a real hell, and it's more horrific than we've ever thought. 
because it is the absence of the light and the love and the life of God. It's, it's where free will creatures who want to play God get their way. And, and angelic and humans trying to dominate or be dominated. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what they describe it like. Oh, oh boy. Like the worst well, prison scene imaginable. I hope, I hope you do write on that. I think it's important. I've read a few books on it, but you know some of them are not that credible, but I think that would be good to look at. I do want to talk about life reviews. So in your new research, you go into greater detail on life reviews. And that was probably one of the most, first of all, describe what a life review is. And then I want to drill down on that. So for those who are not familiar with your work or NDEs, what is this life review that comes up so often in a near-death experience? Well, so in the presence of, of this God and, you know. You're on the I good go, side now, not on the huh? bad side. You're on the good side now, not on the bad side, right? Yeah. yeah, and I mean, we haven't even gone into all the attributes of God. So that's, mm. that's part of what I'm doing. This is, I intended this to be like a comprehensive book about God. His love story that, you know, starts with relationship in Genesis you know, chapter two and, you know, betrayal and divorce. It's got all that, you know, mm. and, and laying down one's life for reconciliation. And it ends in revelation with a great wedding. If we miss the story of God, we miss why he does the confusing things he does. And I'm trying to show that and then show his attributes, all these attributes, and the way people describe in his presence, it's like, you know, like this one um, psychiatrist who's also a neurologist, and in his presence, he said, imagine being five feet away from the epicenter of a nuclear explosion. But it's an explosion of love. Mm. But he said the light was roiling, you know, roiling like a nuclear explosion. Okay. Okay. Another commercial airline pilot said the same thing. He said, I looked at it, it it looked like that instant when an atomic bomb goes off, but the light that was coming out, it was so powerful, but it was love. And then the other guy said, an infinite knowledge and power that was indisputable and Mm. authority that would make you go, whatever you say is right, I get it. And kindness, joy, just births forth purity. He describes purity, um, but also humor Mm. and humility. And I remember when I was interviewing this, you know, he's a doctor of psychiatry and neuroscience. So he's a smart guy, right? And he said, you know, I'm a doctor. I've traveled the world. I've written books. I I have a lot to be proud of. If I had his qualities, I would be boasting around, celebrating myself. He's not like that. And then he breaks down in tears and said, he's so humble. He's so humble. And I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So Holy in, cow. In, in, this, in this being's presence, he gives people a life review. Mm. And consistently carry all over the globe what they come, if they go, if they have that deep of an experience, you know, in the presence of God and the life review, they come back saying what they know for sure is God is love. And the way we love or treat one another is what matters most to God, because that's what he was showing them. So this life review is basically, and, and again, you know, it's made me realize God is so creative. It's a little different for each person but basically, they, he, he's, re-sh- he's re-showing their life many times in like this panoramic three-dimensional replay where they're, they're seeing their every interaction. They're remembering not only what they thought, but they're not just remembering it, they're experiencing it, but they're experiencing it not just from their perspective, but the thoughts and feelings of what was going on with every person they were oh, interacting That's the with part that got me, man. It's like my impact on other people. I shudder to think. To go back over five decades of that, it's like, oh. Well, and and I point out, it's important to remember. So it's it's fascinating because yeah. one thing, well, let me say two things that are that are really important. 
What most near-death experiencers who've had a life review will say is, God was not judging me. God was loving me. Mm-hmm. I was judging myself, and I was a far harsher judge than anybody could ever be. And, and what they're saying is, um, I knew the truth. In, in, and they say this, in heaven, you, you know, on earth— you can, you can rationalize, you can hide from yourself and others, but in, in, in God's presence, you know the truth and there's no hiding, you know? And, and uh, you know, some people who lived really bad lives, like they're like, God, send me back to hell when they had a taste of it. Um, <clears throat> that's what I deserve. And, and then he says, no, and then I'm not worthy of you. And then, you know, you are worthy. And what he's showing is that you're worthy because I made you worthy. Right. So it's not I works the righteousness. Pro- it's not works righteousness. No, no, no. They know that's what they deserve. And they experience God's mercy and grace because, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually sharing, this is Karina's story from Columbia. And, you know, she had a really rough life, but she lived a really rough life too. And when she died, she realized she was dying and suddenly she leaves her body and she realizes, oh my gosh, God is real. She just intuitively like, God's real. And she starts praying the, the, our father, the Lord's prayer. And she gets to forgive me. And she just kept going, forgive me, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. I, I, I realize, you know, and again, I, for some reason, I think when when it's last minute, God lets them see where they were headed and then pulls them out. Mm. So she, again, she had a taste of like, it was like she was going to hell and he rescues her. And she says in his presence, you know, she ex- is experiencing this love and this glory and this light. And she says, Lord, I, I'm so filthy, you know? And she she had an abortion. She... She did all kinds of things, you know, and she's like, I deserve that. I'm not worthy of you. And she, he says, no, you are worthy. I love you. Come, come. And all these people were saying, come, enter, come. And, and, and that's what she realized. That's the grace of God. Doesn't mm. make sense. No. Doesn't make any sense. We're not worthy at all. And, and so I think the life review, though, for, for a Christian— is um, you realize the power of Jesus' crucifixion, what he covered. You know, we kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah. Ah, darn, yeah. you know? But in his presence, you realize he still has the, the scars in his hands. And it's a reminder that our sin hurt him. It hurts him. It hurts his heart. And when people come back, it's not that they want to be good and prove they're good. It's that they don't want to hurt the one who loves them so much. Mm-hmm. It's such a beautiful but more powerful reason, you know? Or And I think, I think what got me a nuance, and it was months ago I read the book, but in some of these life reviews you bring out this time around, you talk about it's not just our actions. So, you know, I might say something really intentionally to you that hurts you. But I believe in the life reviews, and you hinted at it, it's not only our actions, it's our thoughts and the impact yeah. our thoughts have on other people. So I'm driving in traffic and I'm like, that guy's a jerk. Somehow, I don't know, it, it almost felt like that emits vibes into the universe that are not good. And I know that sounds very woo-woo, but like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm doomed. I'm doomed, John. <laughs> like I, it's over for me. Like, but it was, it was that like, like it, and that really impacted my wife too. And she is much more virtuous than I am. So, I mean, I don't think she has a lot to worry about. I have a lot to worry about. If you know what goes inside this head and this heart, it's not good, dude. What did the life review teach about that? Well, Your again, okay, so let me, let me not miss where I started. So many of these people say, I was not feeling judged by God. Now, yeah. for many years, this held me back from writing Imagine Heaven, because I was like, well, wait a second, because God is the righteous judge. Yeah. And yeah. we will, there will be, there is a beam of seed, and there is the great white throne. There are judgments, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, what one day the Lord showed me that was like an aha is when 
when he says, by your own words will you be judged, by your own words will you be acquitted. He said this to the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what he's saying is that is, is what these people are showing. And, you know, Paul, Paul said, and Jesus said, everything that's hidden will be made known. Paul said, um, uh, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 4, um, wait for the Lord. Don't judge anything or anyone. Mm. Wait mm. for the Lord. And then he will bring everything that's hidden to light and reveal the motives of the heart. Our thoughts, our yeah. motives, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was it was convicting for me too, okay. Carrie. Because, um, but but here's the thing: the Lord, there 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 is a judgment of right and wrong. But what what God shows in this life review is that He never removes His love, mm -hmm. and He's mm -hmm. not showing His and and if Jesus has paid for our wrongs, what he wants us to see is what matters and the consequences of those and where it all starts. You know, and that's clear. I mean, gosh, God made it real clear to Moses. Jesus reiterated it. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you fulfill all the commandments. And that, what more powerful testimony when you have people from all over the globe coming back saying basically that, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but you're right in Imagine the God of Heaven. I, I have several overlapping stories that hit me in a new way too, because they said the same things and they didn't know each other's stories when I interviewed right. them. They're not colluding. And they mm -hmm. were talking about how God showed them that, I, I, there are three in there actually, now that I think about it, um, Penny... Um, Kevin and uh, and Erica, and all three in his presence, he showed them that their thoughts lead to, um, you know, their thoughts lead to, to actions, lead to a ripple effect of consequences. And, you know, it's not new again. It's like Paul told us this, take every, take thought, every captive. thought captive. Mm -hmm. Take every mm -hmm. thought captive. But they show how, you know, and Jesus said this, you know, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them. Yeah. It's what comes out of the heart. Mm -hmm. Thoughts of greed and adultery and envy and hatred and and all that. And so yeah, what they, what what the Lord was showing them in their life review is the power of their thoughts because it all starts there. That's where the spiritual battle is is lost or won. Is in our thoughts. And the things we think about other people it either grieves the Lord or or brings joy to the Lord because it's the catalyst of willingness that moves us in a direction. Mm. Right? So it, so it, you know, if 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 you and your your wife or your husband or you know, they're your your struggling stuff and you've got these thoughts that keep waking you up at night and they're they're uh they're going over and over what that person does wrong, well guess what? <laughs> That's moving you in a direction. Well, and, I also got the sense that it leaks, that people pick up that aura or those vibes. Yeah. Maybe I read into it. No, no. I mean, one said that. Um, one said that, and I've thought a lot about that. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I guess, I guess there's, there's, there's some just obvious truth to that. Like if every time I'm around you, yeah, think about it this way. You know, someone your your boss can can be telling you, you know, one thing, but you can pick up that they just don't like you. Mm -hmm. yep. We we have an intuition. Yep. And it picks up, right? It's it's what happens when, you know, when you say, you know, I didn't say that. And technically you didn't say that, but your spouse caught on that that's what you meant. Totally. And that's what's totally. in your heart. Yeah. And they picked up on what was really in your heart. Or where you think you're better than somebody yeah. or you're smarter or yeah. any of those things, you know, it was just yeah. deeply, deeply convicting to me. Yeah. And I'm like, you well, know. again, so, yeah. so let me remind us though, because I find that <laughs> I was talking to my sister the other night and she... <laughs> So eight years later, she hasn't gotten past the hell chapter in Imagine Heaven. She loved oh, it wow. up till there. 
And I was like, the best part is after that because it talks about the rewards of heaven and all that. And she's like, I don't want to, I don't want to read about the life review, man. I don't want I've done so many things wrong. I don't want to deal with that. And I said, you're missing the point. Uh, yeah. Because the point is Jesus has removed those in his mind as far as the East is from the West. So if he's showing someone that in their life review, he's showing it to teach them something about the realities of the consequences and the ripple effect he shows them. You know, like, like Mary Neal, Dr. Mary Neal, um, another doctor who had a near-death experience, and he showed her how her actions, good or bad, affected not just one person, but he showed her how it went 20, 30 people out. But he mm-hmm. also showed her how God used it for good with everyone willing. This is just the scriptures illustrated, right? <laughs> It's a, it's a dual reaction for me. One is get away from me from a man of unclean lips and, you know, I don't deserve you, God. And on the other hand, it just spurs me on to make my life more a reflection of Christ's love and humility and grace. So, uh, Well, I, and, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he will bring to light every motive so that God can reward us. Mm-hmm. So think about that. That's God's motive. It, yeah. It's not to whack us. It's not to say, I gotcha. It's, it's to teach us and eventually to reward us. Like he's a rewarder. And that's, you know, that's what we got to believe. That's faith, right? That he's a rewarder of those who seek him. What was the most surprising finding of all of this? You've oh. been at this for years now. Well, there have been a lot. Honestly, I mean, there've been a lot. Well, let me say the, you know, the last, the last few chapters of Imagine the God of Heaven um, are my favorite because this is surprising that God is a God of such joy yeah. and humor and even fun. And, you know, like intuitively we ought to know that. I mean, if you just stop and think about it, if God is the God we believe created us, he created us with the ability to enjoy every good gift, and he created all these enjoyments and us with the ability to experience these pleasures. Mm-hmm. Why would we think he's sitting there going, man, they're having fun again. Get to work. Well, it depends on the church you were raised in, John. Well, <laughs> you know, fun, fun was a four-letter word in a lot of Christian churches for a long time. Well, and guess what? Maybe we are poisoning the world with the wrong view of God. Here, 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 here. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wrong really? View, wrong view we of the biblical to... God. Mm-hmm. He's not. Yeah. And so I'm, sh- I'm, I'm showing both, you know, like, like one of the, but here's one of the powerful things I think for us that I'm trying to show in this chapter. Well, let me say surprising. Okay. Um, is that God, God would take these two 16 year old girls who, when they die, one of them, I don't, I don't know if I even put hers in there, but she talks about, so Heidi has become, she's a nurse, good, good friend now, um, raised by the way, by Jewish atheist agnostic parents who had a mantra. Her father told her every night, there is no God. Your life is worthless. Jesus is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. She grew up in an abusive household, and every night she prayed to God because she believed, and He was her comfort every night. I think she would that is pray, in the book. and she mm-hmm. she felt this comfort. Mm-hmm. And at sixteen, her horse lands on her, and she's up thirty feet above her body, watching, knows she's dead, and this light over her shoulder moves forward. She turns and looks, and she said, "There was Jesus." just like you would think Jesus looks like. And she said, it was weird because I wasn't thinking, why am I seeing Jesus? What's a nice Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus? You know, She said, no, I knew him. This was the God I prayed to every night. And in her life review, she sees he was sitting by her bed every night as a little girl when she was praying. It was him. I know. But then, and this is, this is the part, he takes her hand and he, and, and now remember Heidi, well, you don't know, but Heidi was like this, 
a young 16 year old who loved to ride bareback horse, horse, just fly, right? She loves speed. And he gets this big grin on his face. And she said, we took off. She said, we took off. And, and it was like, we were flying, but it was like this wave of light under her feet, pushing them both. Cause she looked down and she even touched it and could feel it and felt it on the bottom of her feet. And she said, we were moving faster and faster, like Superman and Lois Lane holding hands and flying through the universe. And Jesus looks at her and just grins and said, isn't this the greatest thing ever? And she said, it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. Now, I, I didn't talk about that for a long time because I was like, I want that to be true, but that's just, I mean, <laughs> that's come out on, there. really? That's out there. Yeah. But then you have another teenager who experiences almost the same thing with Jesus. And then you have this, this agnostic or this, I mean, he wasn't atheist, but he just, the Jim Woodford who died last second prayer before it hits the steering wheel, hellish experience, God rescues him. And then the Lord has, has the angels take him up above the holy city and he gets this aerial view of the holy city and describes just what, like, kind of like what Santosh did, but also what Captain Dale Black, who was another commercial mm -hmm. airline pilot in Imagine Heaven, and they describe the same thing from this kind of like a holding pattern over a large city. They both said, I wonder if God did that because I'm an airline pilot. Wow. Then this gym comes down and the angels, they're walking this beautiful place and they come up to a split rail fence. Now, Jim was um, very wealthy, commercial airline pilot, also owned several multi-million dollar businesses. He had 19 British sports cars, a yacht, his own airplane, and a horse farm because he wow. loved horses, okay? And, um, and when the angels said, come up to the split rail fence, the angels say, look, Jim, and across this meadow, out from behind these trees, come these three gorgeous horses, and he said, I'd never read the Bible. I didn't know Jesus comes back on a white horse. I didn't know there were horses in heaven. <laughs> Which honestly, Carrie, I don't know that I thought that was really true. Even yeah, though I thought metaphorical, it. metaphorical. We've done and a research. that, I would yeah. say, is the most surprising. I yeah. will say that's the most surprising. And that has kind of changed, if I'd say, my theology. But it's, it's not changed what's in the Bible. I think things are that I've taken as metaphorical, and I think on earth are metaphorical, I think there is a reality in heaven to it that's more literal. Yeah. But it's, it's mysterious. Huh. Even like the living water of God that flows throughout heaven, you know? Like Jesus said, I'm the living water, but then to hear people talk about seeing it and, drink, water. Uh -huh. and drinking it and joy just bursting forth from them, and I, you know, it's like so. There are a lot of things that uh, in this. If it weren't that I were seeing and hearing so many of them, and again, I've I've interviewed and researched thousands. Um, I'm going through 40 hours of interviews right now. Uh, you know, just preparing to speak on this next book, and uh, it's just amazing. And if I didn't see them overlapping again and again, I, I wouldn't put it out there. I, I try not to do the one-offs, you know, and there are, there mm -hmm. are one-offs and I, and I kind of go, yeah, I'll just, I'll just put a pause on that and wait and see, you know, does that align with scripture first? And secondly, do other people talk about that? Or is that just, you know, a one-off? Mm. And by the way, let me say one more important thing is that I do not advocate people going and just studying a bunch of NDEs. Okay. I don't. Um, these are testimonies, but it's like I said, it's just like if, if, if you just went around Jerusalem interviewing a bunch of random people, you'd get a bunch of different testimonies mm -hmm. about Jesus, right? Depending on their experience and how deep their experience and whether they knew what God had been foretelling through the scriptures all along, all that factors in. And so what I say is I think altogether— they are giving us witness to the reality of God, the God of all nations, the God of light and love, 
who, as Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the reality of hell, the reality of heaven. But anyone, I don't encourage you to get a theology of God or heaven or hell from. Instead, you got to go to the scriptures. And again, because these NDEs do not tell us what is in eternal life. They don't tell us what's beyond the border or the boundary. Mm -hmm. There's only one, you know, who's come from there, and that's Jesus. Yeah. It's a good word and a good uh, cash on this as well. You know, I think the thing that your work does for me is it reminds me, and this is such a simple theological question, but it's so profound and so deep. Do you really believe God is good? Do you really believe he's good? Yeah. And when I read your books, I'm reminded that he actually is. And better, better, than better, better, we ever amazing, imagined. fantastic. And I would now, say that is the, the, it's the aha of the whole thing is I, yeah. my prayer is that when people read, imagine the God of heaven, even if they thought they loved him, that their love for him and their trust in him will go so much deeper than they, they ever thought it could because they see in a broader perspective how magnificent he is and how truly, as David said, you know, whom in heaven do I desire? Whom, whom, what, do, what on earth do I desire besides you? And who, whom in heaven do I have besides you? It's like, yeah. there's no one besides him. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's what I hope people get is that, oh, you know, every relationship Ultimately, in some ways, it doesn't it's there's something still lacking or lets me down. Every accomplishment, every thrill. But what they consistently say is of all the wonders of heaven, of all the reun reunions of heaven, mm -hmm. of all the mysterious things of heaven, nothing compares. Nothing compares to just being with the Lord. Mm. When they're there, they don't ever want to leave. That's it. Well, this is fascinating. Thank you so much for a really interesting conversation. The book is called Imagine the God of Heaven. It's out now or available for pre-order. Not sure when this is airing. Um, I would love to know where people can connect with you these days, John. Yeah, you can go to um, imaginethegodofheaven.com. So that's the just the book.com or uh, johnburkonline.com. And... Um, then I'm still at Gateway. I'm the founding cool. pastor there. So I'll still be, be speaking, teaching, and um, you, know, you can catch me once in a while on our online campus. Uh, and that's kind of where I'll be hanging out. I'm looking forward to the next books, John, and this new chapter in your life. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary.